to that hall where sin or sorrow e'er can come. I long to see my And to tell the story, I'm saved by His grace, and there upon heaven's golden strand, I'll thank Him for His God. This weary land And some sweet day I'll reach that strand Still guided by The unseen hand
All right, good evening, everyone. Glad to see you here this midweek service. If you would, let's go ahead and grab our hymnals and let's turn to number, or hymn, I should say, Sunlight, number 656. We'll sing the first, third, and fifth verse of that. <clears throat> Six hundred and fifty six. I wandered in the shades of night till Jesus came to me, and with the sunlight of his love did all my darkness flee. Sunlight, sunlight in my soul today. Sunlight, sunlight all along the way Since the Savior found me, took away my sin I have had the sunlight of his love within While walking in the light of God a sweet communion find I press with holy vigor on and leave the world behind Sunlight, sunlight in my soul today Sunlight, sunlight all along the way Since my Savior found me, took away my sin I have had the sunlight of his love within Soon I shall see him as he is the light that came to me Behold the brightness of his face throughout eternity. Sunlight, sunlight in my soul today. Sunlight, sunlight all along the way. Since the Savior found me, took away my sin. I have had the sunlight of his love with Let's turn back to number 545. All right. Each step I take my Savior goes before me and with his loving hand he leads the way and with each breath I whisper I adore thee oh what joy to walk with him each day each step I take I know that he will guide me to higher ground he ever leads me on until someday the last step will be taken each step I take just leads me closer home at times I feel my faith begin to waver when up ahead I see a chasm wide is then I turn and look up to my Savior I am strong when he is by my side each step I take I know take just leads me closer home I trust in God no matter come what may 
for life eternal is in his hand. He holds a key that opens up the way that will lead me to the promised land. Each step I take, I know that he will guide me to higher ground he ever leads me on until someday the last step will be taken each step i take just leads me closer home brother ralph would you ask god's uh, blessing um, for tonight's Amen. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, Sheila. All right. Uh, Pastor John said that he loaded half that truck today. They got it a little early, so... Um, I guess he said the way he said it was you could you pay the same rate for one day or four days depending on just the distance that they're looking at and so they got it early and loaded it up tomorrow around six o'clock he said if you want to come and help finish what's left of it you can come and do that there's some more boxes but it's the furniture um, that will need to be put in and I think the stuff that's going to Julie's house is the last things to go in, and so they're going to drop off there first and then go over to a, um, a place where they can store it. So if you plan on going over there tomorrow, 6 o'clock. Is that right? All right. Just trying to get a heads up. <laughs> There's been a few changes, I know, and so we had to uh, work with those changes, and I said, you know, I, I asked uh, John yesterday, and he said, I'll let you know tomorrow. <laughs> so um, it's just the way it goes. Have you sold the house yet? No offers? No, we have it closed Saturday, so they'll look at an empty house. Mm. Yeah, picture their stuff in there, I guess, huh? All right, well, let's go ahead and take our Bibles tonight. Brother Cy, how are you doing tonight? Pretty good. Good, good to see you tonight. Let's take our Bibles tonight and turn to chapter 30. We've been talking a lot uh, in on... Wednesday nights about God's uh, wisdom and how he used Solomon as he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes and then we had a sort of a topical message last week but I was still thinking about Solomon and how smart that man was <laughs> uh, and he got his smart from his smarts from God uh, God blessed him gave him more wisdom than the men before him than the men after him when God gives you wisdom, it's, it's tr the truth. I mean, it's true wisdom. And Solomon was a real standout. And so I thought about um, here in chapter 30, Agur, uh, the words of Agur, the, the son of uh, J.K., even the prophecy, the man spake unto Ithiel, even unto Ithiel and Eucol. And so uh, Agur... He was a man who thought a little bit different than Solomon, even though he's here in uh, Proverbs, he, he has a little section for him. Solomon wrote Proverbs, but you know, there's a few sections here, like with Agur, 
uh, he was uh, right, put, these were his words that were put in here. And uh, instead of looking at God and seeing the immensity of God and, and uh, kind of like Solomon was doing in a few places, what he chose to do was talk about himself here and uh, also God, but he looked at himself a whole lot different. He wasn't the wisest man of his day and time. He wasn't the wisest, uh, he, you know, of all those before him. He wasn't the wisest of all them after him. He was just a man at this time. But I think as we look at this message, we'll see that he was right on point with what he, what he had to say here. Uh, when we consider the wisdom of God, the wisdom that God gives to men, and how he fit in here in this uh, day and time. Have you ever thought about God in the, in the sense of being infinite and, and how powerful he is? It's just so hard to wrap your head around it, isn't it? I, I don't know about you, but I, I read God's word all the time. I mean, I study it, I preach from it, I teach from the word, and and yet, uh, when I think about God and who he is, it's just, it's hard to wrap yourself around. Uh, it's impossible, really, to him because of his infinite um, uh, position. I mean, he's almighty God. And, and so we just have to read what others have say, said about him here to get different views from a biblical perspective that help us understand God himself. Uh, and as I've tried to study about God and learn more about him, I, it seems like the more I learn about God, the more finite I see myself being, the smaller I recognize that I truly am, am in this world. Have you ever felt like that? You, you just go, boy, there's just so much in this world. I just feel, you know, I, I was reading an article here the other day that said that we're reaching the 8 billion uh, mark for our world's population. That's a lot of people, isn't it? Eight billion. I was thinking it was still around six, but I guess it's multiplying pretty quick. We're coming up on eight billion. I feel pretty small. I'm one of eight billion. How about you? <laughs> well, Somebody once said that man is limited in nature, infinite in his desires, and that may be true. In the message I've given a little title to tonight's message, man is limited, but God is not. It's pretty, pretty easy to understand. Uh, somebody uh, took this, this passage of scripture time and time again, I, I imagine, have looked at it perhaps in different ways. There's not I always believe that scripture, when we read it, there's, there's one answer for it. There's not, God didn't give us all kinds of multiple choices every time we come to a verse in scripture. It's pretty much what it is, and it's right there, and we were to take it literally. Uh, here, Agur reveals three things that I want to concentrate a little bit on tonight. Our limitations. Our, our limited condition, if you will, and then the limitlessness of God. And then thirdly, how do we respond to this relationship? Well, Pastor, we, we're Christians. We're children of God. I know, but we're talking about his limitlessness. God is infinite. He's the living God of all creation. Uh, he, there's no beginning with him, and there's going to be no end to him either. Uh, you and I just got to count back a few years when we say, oh, I was born back here. I was born again on this day. But, you know, my, my body, you know, my physical body, I was born, you know, this many years ago. Well, how do we look at that relationship? I know when I was a kid growing up, my buddy Mark lived about a quarter of a mile down the street. And so at nighttime, I would walk or daytime I'd walk down to his house and then at nighttime when I was coming back home I'd always look up at the stars and think what is out there I mean where do, did all those come from uh, I heard they came from God but I don't know God or who he is but boy it sure is fascinating to look up at all those stars and then I thought well what's beyond those and it just kept on going and I, I couldn't think about it anymore and give it any structure 
Let me read a few more of these verses here. Look at verse 2. Surely I am more brutish than any man and have not the understanding of a man. Neither, or I neither learned wisdom nor have the knowledge of the holy. Father, I ask that you might bless this passage of scripture that we look at tonight. Help us, Lord, as finite people, as just small uh, in the light of eternity, uh, Lord, just help us to understand you uh, to the amount that you would have us to understand you, Lord. You've given us your word here, and we've, uh, most of us here, Lord, uh, for our lives have been studying scripture and learning about you, sitting under preaching and teaching, and or preaching and teaching ourselves. And, and Father, I just uh, pray that you'd help us tonight to consider who you are in this idea, in this realm of infiniteness. And we'll give you the praise and thanks as we look at these things. Amen. So in these first three verses, uh, this is interesting. Agur, you know, he calls himself more brutish than anybody else and have not the understanding of a man. Well, uh, we find out that Solomon had the wisdom of God was given to him. Perhaps Agur was looking at that and thinking to himself, Oh, you know, I'm really brutish compared to Solomon. He is so wise. God give him all this wisdom. I don't even have the wisdom of a man. And he says, I, I neither learned wisdom nor have the knowledge of the holy. So this is really kind of a confession time uh, as, as well. I think Agur had a realistic opinion of himself. He had a safe opinion of himself. You know, some people get out of college and right away they think, well, I've conquered the world and now all I got to do is go out there and grab it by the horns. <laughs> and uh, they think they've learned everything that they need to learn. Uh, Brother Ted, when you finished college, uh, when you went to seminary or to the Bible college, did you think after that now nobody needed to tell you anything about the Bible? <laughs> uh, no. You didn't, because we are, it's just the beginning, isn't it? It's just another step in, in, the, in eternity, really, when you think of it that way. But Agur had a realistic opinion of himself. He wasn't a prideful man. He wasn't saying, well, I'm this and I'm that because of, you know, who I am. I know Solomon. In fact, you know, my words are getting put in there with his. Now, he wasn't that kind of a person. There's that book that goes around every couple of years called Who's Who?, and uh, I remember my college professor, uh, on, he had a little bio on back of one of his books, and he says, he's a member of the Who's Who. And I'm like, Who's Who? who, who what book is that? And I started looking at it, and so, you know, you had all these things you, you have to accomplish in life to get there. And then, so I got a letter from him one time, and they said that they wanted to put me into the Who's Who. And I said, okay, well, what do you need from me? And they told me all these things, and I said, well, that's not me. But then they said, and then we want you to buy the Who's Who book, and it costs money for that. And I said, aha, I knew money was behind this somewhere. There it was. It wasn't me. But uh, when they said, you know, yeah, you got to buy this book here, and I said, no, thank you. I'm not even interested in Who's Who or who's in that book. So <laughs> I'm more interested in Who's Who in the Bible, aren't you? Uh, then, you know, those kinds of things. It was just a gimmick that someone uh, had used. Now, he calls himself unlearned concerning wisdom. Listen, uh, I, I wrote down a few passages of Scripture. Listen to these. Psalms 92, 5 and 6. O Lord, how great are thy works, and thy thoughts are very deep. A brutish man knoweth not, neither doth a fool understand this. And Agur is calling himself a, bru a brutish man. He says he doesn't know anything. And yeah, he, he doesn't know how great God's works are uh, and God's uh, thoughts that are very deep. The psalmist uh, here, under inspiration of God, was able to write that. He also said in uh, Psalms, also says in 73, uh, verse 22, So foolish was I and ignorant. I was as a beast before thee. You know, when we come to realize that when I got saved, I began to realize who God is and just how great he was, and I, I couldn't then get a hold of him, and I cannot now. He's just, you cannot do that with God. He has all wisdom. There, there's no, 
touching it except for what he shares with us here in the scripture in the presence of his Holy Spirit in us. Jeremiah said, every man is brutish in his knowledge. Every one of us when compared to God. Paul told the Corinthians, let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, for it is written, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. I think of all of us here tonight as pinpoints. When you think of the line of eternity and God in eternity past has always been, God is now, and you and I right now are a little pinpoint here, you know, if you're going to pin on to the line of eternity. We're just a little pinpoint here, but God's going to also be around forever and ever and ever. He's also promised us a home in eternity, but we have a beginning, okay? God doesn't. We do. And our beginning is a small one. It's a growth one. And so it's kind of interesting uh, when you think of eternity, our eternity with, with God who is eternal. Look at verse 4. Agur says, Who hath ascended up into heaven or descended? Who hath gathered the wind in his fist? Who hath bound the waters in a garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? What is his name, and what is his son's name, if thou canst tell? And so we discover here, Agur focused on his limits as a man, and you and I know that we are limited creatures as, as well. Uh, Agur focused on God being limitless, here in this verse 4 specifically, Infinite, measureless, endless, eternal, all those words and, you know, all the other ones that a thesaurus might mention along with those apply to our Heavenly Father. Look at that verse 4 closely. Now, you could number all these questions that he has in here, but uh, I, I found five simple questions he asked and no uh, answer was needed for the obvious fact that God is limitless here. Isn't that something? Look, look here. No, uh, no limited man. It says here, only the son of man. Uh, go to uh, John chapter 3 in the New Testament. No limited man has ascended, where he says that first question, who hath ascended up into heaven? Or descended? Well, no, no living man, only, only the Son of God. All right. uh, John chapter 3, the Gospel of John. Sounds like some of you got ahead of me. That's, a, that's good. Look at verse 13. And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. And that's almost, that's, that's a close quote almost, isn't it, with Agur. Uh, who hath ascended up into heaven or descended? So a good question. Well, no limited man. Um, and then the second thing that he says here, who hath gathered the wind in his fist? I thought to myself, well, go ahead and try to do it. You're going to look pretty silly. All right? We cannot do that. God can. Psalms 135.7, he causeth the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He maketh lightnings for their rain. He bringeth the wind out of his treasuries. God has treasuries of natural things. Uh, God can, you know, uh, go to his treasuries and bring out hail when he wants to throw hail on the earth like he did in Egypt. Uh, God has treasures. He has all the, the creatures that are his in this entire world. They're all part of his treasures that he can call bees to, to go after somebody or after a nation, and he's threatened to do that as well. Those kinds of things. It's, no man has this kind of capability. Um, and then he says, Who hath bound the waters in a garment? 
Well, no limited man has. Job said he bindeth up the waters in his thick clouds, and the cloud is not rent under them. God puts all of his water in a cloud, and they don't fall out until he's ready for it uh, to do that. Who hath established all the ends of the earth? Uh, no limited man has, okay? Uh, only our infinite God who created all the heavens and the earth. He measured it, he made it, he molded it, and he maintains it by the power of his word. Genesis 1.1 says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. God the Father spoke, and he spoke creation into being. <laughs> wow. And then there's some things that we pray about, and we think to ourselves, I don't know if God can do this one. <laughs> I don't know if he can handle this. I'm not going to bother God with this. This is too small for God. God does big things, really. God does all things. All things are possible with him. Nothing's too small, nothing's too big, nothing's too wide, nothing, I mean, on and on it goes. Um, he finally, he says here in that verse 4, what is his name and what is his son's name if thou canst tell? Well, his name is God Almighty and his son is Jesus Christ, amen? Um, Agur is really asking some good questions here. In Matthew 11, uh, 27, it says, All things are delivered unto me of my Father. This is Jesus speaking. And no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father, save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. When we became Christians, God sealed us with his Holy Spirit, thereby linking us to himself. We became one with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Uh, God's doing a work on us, and he's got a, a whole lot more to do. But he's doing a great, wonderful work on all of us as believers, works that we cannot understand how he does it. Uh, the Lord's ways are mysterious, only in the sense that uh, he works on a whole different plane than we do, and yet he is able to pause his eternal purposes and activities to speak with us through his word and through his Holy Spirit in us, and just to... Uh, do a work in our life, mold our hearts and shape us. I mean, it's incredible when you think about uh, God's infiniteness. Agur says in verse 5, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield to them that put their trust in him. And then verse 6, Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Now, compared to the words of men, Agur realized that only God could speak pure words. Uh, he's God. Every word that comes out of his mouth, we know, is inspired. And so, Agur, what he is saying here was true um, as he spoke of the Lord. Uh, turn over to uh, Psalms with me. Turn back to Psalms, Psalms 12. Psalms 12 and then um, verse 6, kind of a familiar uh, passage of scripture. It says, the words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. So uh, it says elsewhere, not only Agur said that, but other places say it. Then in Psalms chapter 18 and verse 30, as for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those that trust in him. His word is tried and it's true. 19 uh, in verse uh, 8. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord is pure, or the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening uh, the eyes. And then, of course, uh, Psalms 119 Whenever you're talking about God's word, we got to go there. And verse 140. 
Thy word is very pure, therefore thy servant loveth it. Um, Agar uh, knew this, Agar, uh, when he said this, Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Or verse 5 also, Every word of God is pure, he is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. I, w I don't want to be found a liar, do you? <laughs> um, and, you know, when pastor preaches and, or when I teach and I'm, I'm teaching out of God's word, listen, I study. I'm, I'm one of those guys who has to study. I've got to get into the word and make sure I'm in the right context and I've interpreted it and I've prayed over it before I give it to somebody who's going to apply it in their life. And, uh, boy, God's word is, is pure. It, it is tried. It is, it is true. It's proven itself. Uh, somebody once said God's word is uh, able to take care of itself. It's like a lion. Just turn it loose. It, it'll take care of itself. You just got to let it go and uh, let people hear the very word of God, and they'll, they'll understand that. Over in James chapter 3, in the New Testament... And verse 17, James says, But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good uh, fruits, without uh, partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. And so what a good uh, passage that is. God, God's word is pure. That's the word from heaven. Uh, we can bank on it. We can trust uh, the Lord. His word is flawless. It's unblemished. There, we, can't, we can't rebuttal it. It's untainted. It's untarnished. It's impeccable. It's clean throughout. And I, I like that about God's word. I read it every day. And as I'm going through it, I, I never have to pause and doubt, wait a minute, this isn't God's word. What? No, every day when I go to it, it's God's pure words, and I just read it, and I, I enjoy it and have a passion to, to do so because it's pure word. How many of you like pure honey? Oh, yeah. I like honey, and I, I like pure honey. I don't like the other. There's some I guess you can get, and it's, it's been, oh, what do they call it? It's, uh, there's different names for it, but some of it's like white when you get it, and it's all hard and some of them put the cones in there and do all that, but I like the pure honey. And uh, I, I think of God's word when I think of it being pure as well. It's something that you really like and you favor it uh, very much. So God and God's words are a shield to us. They're dependable. They're truthful. They protect us from false teachings. In the New Testament, the Bible tells us that God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but one of power, love, and a sound mind. Where does that sound mind come from? God's spirit in us and God's word. Pastor, I've heard you say that before. You'll hear me say it again, too, because it's true. It's a wonderful truth. We have a sound mind, not because we're so smart, but because God has given us a, a, a sound mind, a biblical-oriented uh, mind, a, a worldview, if you will, that's a biblical view of the world. Where else would we want to go? The, the world we already found from what I read out of 1 Corinthians, the world's words are foolishness uh, to God, man's words. Romans 3, 4, the uh, last part of it says, Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. And then uh, this one you can look up with me. Uh, Revelation chapter 22. Verse 18. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in his book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of the prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. 
But I certainly don't want to do that, and I know nobody here wants to do that either. Uh, we want to embrace God's word. We want to receive his word, not so we can edit God's word, but so that we can act upon what his word tells us uh, to do. Uh, in verse 7, back in chapter 30, Agur says, Two things have I required of thee, deny me them not before I die. Remove far from me vanity and lies. Just think of that for a minute. <laughs> I, I think if we had that in our lives, those things, we didn't have vanities and, and lies that would come our way, what, life would be a whole lot different, wouldn't it? When you consider what's out in the world, life would just be so much different without those. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me, uh, Eager says. Then in verse 9, lest I be full and deny thee and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my God in vain. How do we respond to our relationship with God, as I had alluded to earlier? Once we realize our limits, we ought to recognize God is limitless and ask him to meet our needs. Look what Agur said. He said here in verse 2, I am more brutish than any man. I, I neither learned wisdom nor have the knowledge of the holy. What's he asking for here? All these things. He's not, he's not asking uh, to exalt himself. Remove fire from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me. I wonder when, what he meant by that. I, I know physically it would have just been uh, you know, food, enough food for my body to sustain me, but also spiritually I think he saw God's word as a food as well. But he says, lest I be full and deny thee and say, who is the Lord? What he's saying, unless I get really prideful. You know, if we fill ourselves with ourselves, we can really get prideful. You ever hear that? How do they say that? Oh, they're just full of themselves. <laughs> Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my God in, in vain. And so he knew, he knew he was just a man. He knew he was limited. But he's asking of God for these things. Obviously, Agur preferred God's truth and wisdom instead of being found a liar or, or instead of being found with his own knowledge, which was pretty base, like everyone else's. The psalmist uh, said in uh, Psalm 119, verse 29, Remove from me the way of lying and grant me thy law graciously. We, we've all been involved in lying at some time or another because of sin. Sinners lie and it permeates uh, all of society. Agur asked the unlimited God to help him in this area. Really, when he said this, was he not confessing a weakness that he had? He says, Lord, I, you know, I require from you. He wasn't demanding God or you know, giving God a command. He's just letting them know these are things that I, I need to have. I want to have these things in my life. Secondly, Agur asked the Lord for neither the poverty or riches, Poor and rich people have temptations and snares associated with them. Just because somebody's rich doesn't mean they have no temptations, just like somebody who is poor. We're still human. Thirdly, he asked him to meet his needs in life, not endless desires. He wanted to live his life for God and have his needs met, and he was, would be satisfied with that. Look at that verse 9 again. Lest I be full and deny thee, and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my God in vain. He really hunted for contentment, self-contentment. I guess as you look out into the eternity and you see so much out there and, and you realize how limitless God is, you think, you think about yourself, you say, Lord, just help me to be content. Why am I, why am I not content? And help me to be content. 
I have a place in this world or in life, if you will. And now as Christians, we have a place in, in heaven. Amen. He understood as a limited man that he needed the pure words of an unlimited creator to live for God and to be content. I'm not sure what makes you content, but I'm willing to guess this is a Wednesday night, and our core church folks are here tonight and over in the other fellowship hall as well, and then downstairs perhaps. But, uh, you know, I'm willing to say we know that we would be discontent without the Lord. Could you be content without the Lord? Uh Uh-uh. Before I got saved, I thought I was a pretty good person. I thought I was smart. (laughs) Thought I was good looking. Hey, watch out. I thought all that stuff. But once I got saved, I realized how discontented of a life I really lived. And I'd only boast about those things to make myself feel better or bigger in the eyes of other people. When really, just like Hager, I didn't learn wisdom nor have the knowledge of the holy when I was in that state of mind. But once I got saved, God turned it around and gave me a true contentment that no one can ever take away. Man is limited. God is not. I think all of us at times have reached the end of our limits. Have you ever had a a dog and you've had him on the leash and it's kind of a long one or you just let him run until he reaches the end and he ain't going any further. (laughs) The dog's reached his limit with you. But with God, God hasn't done that uh, uh, with us. We might reach our own limits, but there is no limit with God. With him, all things are possible. And he gives us everything that we need to help us to be content right now in this situation. He'll do the same thing when we depart this earth and go to be with him. We're going to be content there, too. Might as well start being content right here, right? (laughs) And give God the praise. Uh, He can handle it. He can handle all of us at one time talking to him. And in fact, the 8 billion people that we have in this world, if they would all cry out to God tonight, today, at this very hour, all around the world, God would hear every one of them. How can he do that? Because he's limitless. I, I don't even know what that, I don't even know how to comprehend that. If he was listening, I'm like, I wouldn't even know how to comprehend that, but I know he could do it. But, now that we've been looking at this, right now I know only about what's, who's here tonight. And God is able to speak to us and help us to be content. And I'm thankful for that. Lord, we just want to thank you tonight for your word. Eger, Lord, was a, a man uh, whose name was, his words were put in the book of Proverbs in Solomon's book, primarily Solomon. And Lord, uh, I'm glad that you put him in there. He's, he was a level-headed man, and uh, he was down to earth, and he just cried out to you. And I'm sure that you met his needs, Lord, and gave him that contentment, the simple things in life that he wanted. Lord, I pray for each of us here tonight. Help us to be satisfied with whatever lot you have given us, and to give you praise. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's uh, 